there's one energy form that constantly surrounds us, and that is sound. And there's so many sources of sound, it would be impossible to try and list them all. Everything from a dripping water faucet to an exploding firework. But your students should be aware of this, all the many different sounds and their respective sources, and they should learn to start identifying some of them. They should also learn about the characteristics of sound, pitch, loudness, and quality. And they should understand the nature of sound, what it is, and how it travels through different materials, and how we receive it. Let's start with looking at the sources of sound. Take your tape recorder out around the school and record some local sounds. Bring it back and play it for your students. Have them identify as many different sounds as they can and the source of that sound. You can also put individual sounds on the tape like a telephone ringing or a man laughing or an alarm clock going off. And ask the students how that particular sound makes them feel and they'll see that there's feelings associated with sounds too. You can also have members of your class imitate sounds of animals or machines. As we look further into sound, we need to understand these characteristics to characterize sound better, like pitch and loudness. So let's now take a look at the nature of sound. We know that heat, light, and radio waves can travel through an empty space. We can feel the heat and see the light from our sun, and we can communicate with the astronauts that are up in space with radio. But sound is different. Sound has to have a medium in which to travel. Whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas, it must have a material. It cannot travel through a vacuum or an empty space. Imagine if it could, what our sun would sound like. We want to develop a model of sound, something the students can understand. It's important to think of sound as an energy form that's traveling through the material, but not disturbing the material as it goes, not taking the material with it. Let's think of these dominoes, individual dominoes, as little particles of air. And a sound is about to happen right in this little small opening between them. As the sound happens, the students will see that the sound radiates out in all directions. And after the sound has taken place, the particles are still basically in the same location they were before the sound started. Watch what happens. Now before you go out and get your dominoes, get some checkers too, and line up five of them end to end. Flip this outside checker into the pile, and watch this one. We're demonstrating once again that energy can be transferred from one particle to another with a pushing motion. But there's more to it than that. There's the wave motion that we really need to understand so that we can understand pitch and why some sounds are higher than others. To do this, we'll start out with a slinky. There's something magical about these things. Whenever you pull them out and start using them in your class, you're going to get 100% attention from your students. In this case, we're going to demonstrate what a sound wave would look like if we could see one. And start by putting some twist ties in the middle of your spring. These are spaced about 15 loops apart. Hang it vertically. Now remember that a sound wave is a push wave. It's not a shake wave like sideways. So we want to demonstrate it as a push wave. The way to do that is to bunch two springs together and let go. And you can see the wave propagate through the spring. We want to illustrate what loudness is or volume. So take one spring and just lift it up a little bit and let it go. The wave isn't very strong as it goes through the spring. But if you lift it up a lot and let it go, there's a much stronger wave. That's what a loud sound would look like compared to a soft sound. And now frequency or pitch. In this case, have the students count the number of waves they see going down the spring in a 10 second interval. So we start the clock and you go and send waves at a rep repetitive rate through the spring for 10 seconds and see how many they counted. And then have them do the same experiment again, but this time you go a lot faster. Send them through with a lot greater frequency. Tell them that the fast frequency is the higher pitch sound and maybe whistle a high pitch sound or play one on an instrument. And the one that's slower, where there's fewer beats or waves per 10 seconds, that's a lower frequency sound and whistle a lower tune. 
We can also demonstrate it with tuning forks. A tuning fork vibrates and we want to illustrate that there's waves vibrating outward. So you can hit the tuning fork and hold it in a cup of water and students can see the waves radiating out from the tuning fork. Or if you have an overhead projector, it's even better because you can take a clear dish with water in it, do the same experiment and actually project the waves radiating out from the tuning fork on your screen. Another thing you can do if you don't have either of those is get a styrofoam cup and put a rubber band around it. And then if you look at it just the right angle, you can pluck the rubber band and you can see the waves radiating out in the water. Whenever we hear a sound, there must be something moving to create that sound. And someone might say, well, a radio isn't moving. But if you look inside at the speaker, you'll see that cone of that speaker vibrating back and forth to make the sound. When you light a match, it's not moving, but the gases are. They're expanding outward and creating the noise that we hear when the match lights. So whenever you hear a sound next, think about what is actually moving to create that sound. Now let's investigate how pitch varies by how long an object is, how much tension that object is under, or how much mass is in the object. If you have more than one tuning fork, allow your students to discover the relationship between the length of the tuning fork and the particular pitch of the fork. They should find that the longer tuning forks produce the lower frequency sounds. We can expand with this concept by putting a ruler over the edge of a table, pressing down on the ruler and plucking it and listening to the note we make, and then extending the ruler, making it longer. Would we expect a lower pitch or a higher pitch? Well, according to our tuning forks, we would expect a lower pitch. Students can go on and make their own instruments. This one's a homemade guitar, and it's nothing more than a ruler with a rubber band stretched around the top with two pencils to set the rubber band up. This time we're pressed down in the middle here, about six inches, and pluck the rubber band and listen to the tone we make. And then move closer to the pencil and see how that affects the tone. The shorter the rubber band, the faster it vibrates, the higher the pitch. This is a good relationship to discover. When we talk about guitars, there's another factor to take into account. That's tension. How tight is this rubber band? How tight is the string on a guitar? And when you tighten the string down on a guitar, you're going to make the string vibrate faster, so you're going to increase the pitch. So there's a relationship between tension also. And you can investigate that with a rubber band. Holding it this distance, about two inches, pluck the rubber band and listen to the note you make. And then stretch it so there's more tension on it, but make sure it's still two inches. So with a lot more tension and still two inches, pluck it again. Students will see that more tension produces a higher pitch. The third variable we want to investigate is mass. How does mass affect the pitch of a note? Well, this way we can just put water in glasses, drinking glasses, and one with a lot of water in it, that weighs a lot, it's very massive, and one with just a little water. Which one will have the lower note? Well, we experiment, and we find out that the most massive one, the heaviest one, has the lowest note. And a good activity in itself is just to mix these glasses all up. Have 10 or 15 of them even, and let students order them according to pitch, from highest to lowest. It's a good way to get them to learn about pitch and frequency. Let's take this idea and go back to our rulers. Here's a plastic ruler and our wood ruler. We'll set them both at four inches so they're the same length. And we'll press down on both of them and we'll pluck them and listen to the sounds we make. It sounds like the plastic one has a lower pitch than the wooden one. According to this experiment, what can we now presume? Which one do you think would weigh the most, the plastic one or the wooden one? Well, the most massive produces the lowest note, so it would appear that the plastic one would weigh the most, and in fact it does. As we investigate sound further, we can always have fun with these simple little instruments. Let me show you a couple more that your students can make. 
Every musical instrument that I can think of works on one of those three principles. Amount of mass, like a big drum, a bass drum, or the amount of tension, like a guitar string or violin string, or the amount of length of column of something, how long something is, like an air column inside of a flute or inside of a, a horn. This little instrument illustrates that. It shows how air columns affect the tone. As we get longer air columns, we get lower tones. Students can make something similar to this by getting a soda straw, cutting it almost all the way off. This is a plastic straw, setting it in a jar of water, and carefully squeezing the end down just right so it blows a stream of air across the top of the straw. By moving the straw up and down in the jar of water, they'll be regulating the air column inside the tube and making a lower note or a higher note. Let's see how this works. You can see I still need some practice with this. Another thing we can make is a kazoo. A kazoo shows that things vibrate when we make noise. And in this case, it's the vibrating wax paper on the end of the kazoo. It's nothing more than a tissue tube with a hole punched in the side with a pencil. Stretch the wax paper very tight over the end and put a rubber band around it. If your kazoo isn't working good, it's probably because this wax paper isn't tight enough. But once it's set up like this, you make a real nice noise instrument here. Another thing I found out, and I've been checking with my slinky, is that you can take a cardboard carton and put an eye bolt on the bottom and a piece of wood inside to connect it, and then hook your slinky to it. And it sounds almost like the swords in Star Wars when you, when you pluck the slinky. It, it amplifies the sound and makes some really neat noises. As we go on to investigate our voice, someone might say, well, when we talk, there's nothing moving. But in fact, there is. There's our vocal cords. They're vibrating to produce sounds. You can illustrate that by blowing up a balloon. And I know it's kind of horrifying, so I won't do it. But by stretching the piece of balloon as the air runs out. This is a very good demonstration, illustration of how our vocal cords work because it's very much like the little flapper end of this balloon. As we push air out through our vocal cords, we're making this vibration and we're producing sounds. Students can feel themselves talk by pressing on their vocal cords very lightly on their Adam's apple while they talk. They can feel the vibrations. You can also get a long paper towel tube and hold it up to your throat and swallow some water while another person listens through the paper towel tube. You'd be surprised. That is really loud. You can hear this big gulp as the water goes down the person's throat. There's really lots of exciting activities we can do. Let's go on now and investigate how sound travels through different materials, solids, liquids, and gases. Almost all of the sound we hear is traveling through air, so we know that sound travels through a gas. But what about liquids and solids? Well, long ago, the Indians knew that sound traveled through solids, and they put their ear to the ground and listened for herds of animals so they could hunt them. Today, you can have your students do this by putting their ear to a desk and scratching the desktop. They'll hear the sound going through the wood. Or you can get a tuning fork and strike the tuning fork and set the bottom of the tuning fork down on the tabletop. And anybody whose ear is anywhere on the wood will hear the greatly amplified sound from the tuning fork. In fact, the tuning fork will sound louder if you just put it on the tabletop because the table will start to vibrate with that frequency like a guitar would. Students can go on and investigate sound traveling through solids by getting a plastic cup and a string, tying the string into the plastic cup and then to a spoon. One student listens to it and another student taps the spoon. They can hear the magnified sound coming up the string, vibrating the cup, and then vibrating the air, which they then receive. And then remember those old tin can telephones. Well, turns out it works better now with plastic, plastic cups. And this particular one is a party line. It's a three-way telephone. Remember that the string has to be very taut to get the signal to transfer because it has to vibrate along the string. And this, this really will work. Going on now, let's investigate how sound travels through liquids. How can we do that? Get your fish tank out 
have one student come up and put his or her ear against the side of the fish tank. And then another student reach into the tank with two rocks and tap them together. The student with their ear against the tank should hear the sound. In fact, sound travels a lot faster in liquid than it does in air. Another idea to get across is echoes. What are echoes and how do they happen? Well, remember when we had the mirrors and we were reflecting the light? Sound reflects the same way. Sound reflects when it goes from one medium and hits another. If it's traveling through air and only air, it won't reflect. But if it all of a sudden hits a big wall or a cliff, it'll bounce off. The angle it bounces and all the different factors involved depend on the particular shape of the cliff. When we have an echo, we want to explain how it works, how it's reflected. We can use our slinky once again. This time set your coil on the table and start your wave from one end. You'll see it go across and hit your hand at the other and bounce back and forth. This is showing how sound echoes back and forth. A final topic we should cover is our ear. How does our ear work? It's really a very fantastic organ because it takes these invisible vibrations, these things that we can't see, but we can detect with our ear, and it converts them to impulses that our brain can break down and tell us whether it's a high note, a middle note, or a low note. It tells us all that range. It's limited, though. We can only hear from 20 vibrations per second to about 20,000 vibrations per second. Some animals, of course, can hear higher frequencies than we can. The first interesting thing about our ear is that there's little canals in there, little tubes in there that allow us to keep our equilibrium, to keep from falling over. If we had our eyes shut and we were sitting in a wagon and someone pulled the wagon forward, we would know we were going forward. If they pushed the wagon backward, we would know we were going backward. That's part of our ear. And when you're spinning around, it's these little tubes that, that lose control, that make us feel dizzy. How do they work? Well, it can very simply be explained with a beaker of water. When you're tilting your head to the left, the liquid is tilted to the left, and your brain can sense more liquid on one side than the other. So it tells you that you're tilted to the left, that you should probably compensate for it somehow or another. If you're tilted to the right, it works the opposite way. So that's a very interesting part of our ear. Another interesting thing is to see how the ear works. It's comprised of three parts, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The purpose of the outer ear is to collect the sound vibrations. These vibrations strike the eardrum, which makes it vibrate, much like the wax paper on the end of the kazoo. Attached to the inside of the eardrum, in the middle ear, are three tiny bones, which begin to move. The very last bone is connected to an organ called the cochlea. It's a long tube-shaped affair that's wrapped up around itself like a snail shell, and it's filled with liquid. And this last bone acts like a plunger and pushes on the liquid when it moves. It makes the vibrations from the sound travel through the liquid. Now, inside the cochlea are 24,000 tiny little hairs. Think of them as tiny little rulers. When the sound travels through the liquid, it makes these little hairs vibrate. The longer hairs are located near the end of the cochlea, and they vibrate at the low frequency sounds. And the shorter hairs are near the base of the cochlea. They vibrate at the high frequency sounds. These vibrations are converted to electrical impulses. And nerves take the electrical impulses to the brain. It's the brain that decides what type of sounds we're hearing. The best way to describe an ear is to think of it as a microphone. It converts sound into electrical impulses. Through study of the ear, students should develop an awareness and an appreciation for their sense of hearing and properly safeguard it. For example, putting things in your ear is very dangerous, just like a pencil can break the diaphragm on a kazoo. And Listening to loud noises is also very dangerous because it can result in hearing loss. Both of these topics should be covered.